Pakistan's former Prime Minister Shokat Aziz absolves Pakistan from its crucial role in the fight against terrorism, as he calls it an international issue. In an interview with Voice of America, Mr. Aziz skips the question on militant presence in Pakistan's Punjab province. He believes that U.S.-Pakistan relations are based on mutual interests. Mr. Aziz was the top gun of former military dictator General Parvez Musharraf in the years following the 9-11 attacks and worked with him as his prime minister. Though Shokat Aziz's critics claim he had little to do with state affairs of Pakistan, he, however, claims in his new book, From Banking to the Thorny World of Politics, that he led Pakistan in its climax of economic crisis. Mr. Aziz was in VOA studios to discuss issues ranging from politics to Pakistan's role in the war on terror. Furthermore, U.S.-Pak relations and Pakistan's ties with Afghanistan and India. Voice of America, Iftikhar Hussain, brings you more. You are in D.C. and uh, the Pakistan-U.S. relation is again on a downward trajectory. You had been near to U.S. officials during when you were prime minister what you make of it and why this transactional relationship as you have referred to in your book continues the ups and downs and the hiccups. Yeah, first of all, the United States and Pakistan have a historical relationship which goes back a long time. It has seen its challenges which arise in any relationship. And the reason I call it transactional is because it burns very strongly when there's mutual interest and need and when there is no mutual interest in need, it slows down. But the relationship stays. Pakistan's position, Pakistan's role in the world and in that part of Asia is critical. And uh, because of the fact that we are located at the crossroads of uh, so many different areas and countries, for example, we are the access to Afghanistan for the world mm -hmm. in terms of uh, our physical relocation. The Karachi port still services all the Afghan imports. The two countries are linked. The two countries have similar faith and similar culture in many ways. So we have, Pakistan has a unique position. At the same time, Pakistan is also a nuclear power, mm -hmm. which attracts a lot of other uh, uh, stakeholders mm -hmm. to get closer to Pakistan and understand what we are doing and why it is, it is not a normal country. Mm -hmm. It is a special country because of the nuclear power, because of its location, and because of its desire to live in peace and have a good, strong economy for its people. And if you see the track record of Pakistan, it is one, of, one country in the region which has always had positive economic growth. And that process continues. Governments have come, governments have gone, but we are going on a trajectory of peace, progress, and prosperity. Yeah, and uh, lately there have been calls from the Congress to release Dr. Afridi. And uh, you know the history of uh, when Osama bin Laden was killed in Pakistan. There's a lot of mentioning on that. Even I, I, I was not convinced that why Pakistan did not believe in Karzai in 2006 told Pakistan that he is somewhere, you have written in the book, somewhere in an urban center in Pakistan that he suspects. But my question is, what is your take on Dr. Shaquille Afridi in the United States? It's, it looks like a I left think, test uh, for, uh, for the relationship. Is, uh, in my mind, uh, we have to respect the laws of every country where the particular situation occurred. Under Pakistani laws, he has been sentenced. He will have to complete his term. And then the law will take its course. We cannot change laws for one individual or another individual. The laws apply equally to everybody. Right. And um, in the book, you says uh, a U.S. Treasury official you quoted that you know a lot about the secret uh, financing of terrorist organization. You are a banker, you know the bank infrastructure in Pakistan. That is still happening in Pakistan. I what think, can be I done? Think you did not read it properly. Mm -hmm. May I just say what I said, because I said it, which is that uh, because I've been a banker for 30 years around the world, I know the nitty gritty of banking better than officials who are just uh, there because of other reasons around the world. Yeah. And the nitty gritty, not everybody understands and knows. So I do know nitty gritty of banking because I did it for 30 years. Yeah. And I started as a young officer in Citibank, an American bank in Karachi. And I continued my career and reached the senior management of the bank. 
level, a senior management level, and I did this in uh, several countries, and I ran large regions of the uh, world for Citibank. For example, I was head of Asia. I was head before that of Central Eastern Europe, Middle East Africa. So that is what the book is referring to, that he has so much rich experience of banking in the real sense that he can understand and see what the issues are. The book says you know volumes about. I remember yeah. those exact Because words. I have 30 yeah. years of experience. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't so, sitting there said, doing yeah. nothing, so I know what's... The terrorist financing, the question was, it is still continues, it still continues in Pakistan, in your opinion, how it can be curbed further? No, I don't, I don't think uh, any terrorist around the world, by the way, terrorism is not related to Pakistan, it's a global issue. Uh, they don't go through the banking system, they must have other channels. And it is for the, and these things keep changing. So uh, banking also is dynamic and the people who are involved in terrorism, they use techniques and processes and procedures which change with time. So what you are seeing is uh, new trends and new, so the bankers, I don't do banking anymore. Yeah. I've been doing other things, but at least I uh, can give people guidelines what to look for. Mm -hmm. And then it's up to them to find out. It's like when you go to a doctor, you get an analysis of different uh, uh, reasons why you're not well. And then the doctor takes a decision and then gives you the medicine. So that's really, uh, the doctor doesn't make the medicine. Yeah. He knows what to do when, uh, after judging how well or unwell you are. Yeah, uh, going to the uh, Afghan Taliban peace process, mm -hmm. Pakistan is in the lead role. It is playing central role. Um, but the international community in the U.S. has the impression that Pakistan has not delivered. Why this process is not moving forward? Pakistan is a country which believes in peace and harmony. Pakistan is a country which wants to see a strong, stable, growing Afghanistan. Because I have always said that Pakistan and Afghanistan are joined at the hip. We are connected in many ways and we can't wish each other away. We have to learn to live with each other and trust each other. Pakistan, due to events in Afghanistan, has paid a huge price. Millions of refugees, other issues which develop as a result, the spread of extremism, terrorism. It's the same area when I was a student, as you saw in the book, I went, my first overseas journey was a bus journey to Kabul. And uh, by the way, I like that part very much, it's connecting you. me personally to what yes. you said, yes. yeah. So I and a friend, we went yeah. there and it was peaceful, Kabul was, yeah. you know, music was playing, people were, uh, there was not one bullet hole in any wall. Mm -hmm. And then I went later when I became finance minister and I was in shock as to what I saw. It, I was almost, uh, I was really uh, very uh, uh, shaken by what I saw. So the point is, Pakistan and Afghanistan have to live together, as I said. We have to live in peace, and we have tried our best to help each other. However, clearly, you know, it's a free world. There are people who have different views yeah. as to how each country should function and each country should be run. And that is where the leadership has to get together. And we have to trust each other, and we have to de decide our destiny and our direction ourselves. Each country has to do that. They are sovereign countries. They have to decide ourselves. And of course, friends will give us advice, guidance, but uh, at the end of the day, it's our country, our region, and we have to decide collectively together. Yeah, and in your book, you do say that um, there was a period in which Pakistan moved away from the Taliban and then coming back that if America leaves and because of the situation, they have to continue their relationship. Do you think, is it in the uh, interest of Pakistan to continue their relationship? You see, Taliban are a, a group of uh, people who are uh, active in Afghanistan. There are elements in Pakistan too. We deal with everybody. I mean, they are citizens of some country, either Afghanistan or Pakistan. And we must engage everybody and try to move them in a direction which will help grow the country and result in a peaceful society. Correct. And uh, <coughs> going to relationship with India, Pakistan. Both are kind of, again, the same thing, back and forth, moving forward, one step, two step backward. In your opinion, what it takes for Pakistan and India both, not only Pakistan, to move forward? Yeah. 
We came, uh, Pakistan and India have a long relationship. There are some fundamental issues between the two countries which need to be resolved, the Kashmir issue being one of them. This is uh, the cornerstone of the current situation between India and Pakistan. Mm -hmm. uh, Kashmir uh, is disputed territory. There's UN resolutions which highlighted how it should be fixed. And I think dialogue between the two countries can then move this process along. We've had a few attempts, in fact. Even in our time, we had uh, dialogue. And with, between uh, the governments of Pakistan and governments of India, we made progress. But unfortunately, the government which had negotiated with us lost the election. So that deal could not be implemented. So there are many approaches and many uh, f forms of uh, peace which can be negotiated. But the two countries have to sit together. All the stakeholders have to be together. And if some friendly countries help, there is no harm. The sign of wisdom is to seek advice from all who can add a positive role to the whole process. But for that region to develop, we must do whatever it takes to create the trust, reduce the trust deficit, and get uh, the ability for both countries to work together. Uh, we have to create the situation of what people call the win-win. And the potential in both countries is enormous. If we can settle uh, our relationships and improve them, I think the dividend, the peace dividend, will be a game changer for that whole region. Because the potential is very, very uh, extensive. Pakistan continues to consider India as an existential threat, while the homegrown Anderson Agency challenges the state on a daily basis. You think they need to change the policy? I'm, I'm not... I've as been, an expert, as a former I've prime minister. I've been in government. I've never heard this threat mentioned the way you have. Mm -hmm. So maybe you know something I don't. We have, with all our neighbors, we want to live in peace. Mm -hmm. Uh, there is, uh, and we have to, peace is achieved through strength, not weakness. So if a country uh, creates its defensive capability, it doesn't mean it wants to fight a war. It just don't, doesn't want to be uh, in a situation where if there is tension, we don't, uh, we are not caught napping. So that's really the thing. So there is no theory that we will have war with A and peace with B, no. To, in today's world, you have to live in peace with all people, try to settle your disputes. Even if you have disputes, you can still have many things going on. So you can have trade, you can have investment, you can have flow of people. And you can then build the atmospherics to come to a stage where you can negotiate and agree. With Correct. And, and supplementary question to this, how much big a challenge is the homegrown insurgency in the terrorist organization, especially in Punjab? Yeah. Any, any insurgency, whether it's homegrown or imported, the fact is it's in, if there is terrorism and extremism, that becomes a serious threat to any country. Mm -hmm. And today it's a global threat, frankly. It can occur anywhere. It recognizes no borders. And that is why the world has come much more together than it used to be, to fight, uh, to fight this threat and to look at the root causes. And uh, it is not just a threat which is a security issue or a policing issue or a military issue. It is an issue of hearts and minds, mm -hmm. why people behave in a certain way. What are the root causes? And if you see in the book, it has mentioned in extensive detail that we must go into the root causes of why this happens. Address the root causes. If you don't, if you're working just with the symptoms, you will never get to the root of the problem. And that is my message to all our viewers today that we must collectively look at the root causes. And this is not just to our region. I'm talking you yeah, know, the around the world. Yeah. This is happening everywhere. And so that is where we need to work. We, if we ju just look at it as a security issue, you go, you catch somebody, problem may, may not be solved. There may be 100 other people ready to do that around the world. And I'm not saying one region. Around the world, this is needed. Uh, what are the major reasons your book, uh, you're suggesting people should read it? I think uh, I don't tell anybody to read or not read, but the fact is, but it is the exp you know, it, it, it is. I think it's a very good uh, opportunity to see how somebody from the middle class, not a privileged family, who worked hard on merit yeah. and reached uh, a global platform in a company where uh, Citibank, is, yeah. which is a meritocracy, nobody cares whose son you are, whose brother you are, which tribe you belong. 
They just look at professionalism and competence. And that is really the, uh, what we are trying to uh, achieve here. And I'm very proud of the fact that uh, without any knowing anybody, just on merit, I was in an organization which was a meritocracy. Yeah. And that recognizes talent. And if, you, if all major companies can become that way, and all societies can become that way, you will see more and more talent coming. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. a lot. Thank you. Bye -bye.